Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our uh, May IBA stage event. Um, for those of you less familiar with this series, IBA stage is a series of online events uh, in which invited biennials have a chance to deliver a presentation of their most uh, recent project. The series was uh, developed very much as a response to the impossibility of traveling uh, during uh, the height of the COVID pandemic. But uh, as we saw from, from your response and uh, while thinking about uh, other uh, goals that we can achieve with this, uh, we decided uh, to, to keep it as part of our public program. Um, and uh, for those of you that have instead been following, uh, you can see that we're slowly building up uh, a quite rich archive of, um, of biennials uh, told uh, from the voice of their makers, which was, uh, I think, quite, a, um, quite an important uh, achievement for, for us at IBA. Um, before I introduce our guest uh, today, I just want to go over some basic house rules. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and uh, first of all, I want to uh, want to remind everyone that uh, this event is being recorded and also currently live streamed uh, through our social media outlets. Uh, and I take a moment also to uh, greet those that are joining us from our YouTube channel. Uh, it's great to have you with us. And uh, so about the house rules, uh, we're all quite familiar with them by now. Um, so please do keep your uh, mics and uh, cameras off uh, for the duration of the presentation. Uh, you're more than welcome to uh, turn your camera on uh, during the Q&A session, because it's great to see each other, of course. Uh, but do please keep the mic off until uh, uh, you are asked to, to pose a question. Um, for the questions, uh, one way of, uh, uh, of posing them is, of course, to uh, write them in the chat. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can use the raise hand function in your Zoom uh, for those that are in the Zoom uh, with us. And uh, we'll make sure to give you the, um, the floor uh, as soon as possible. Uh, I mentioned already that the session is being recorded. Uh, uh, it will also be uh, published on our YouTube channel and on our sites afterwards in about a week or so uh, after the event uh, for those that want to uh, go back to it uh, uh, and and uh, um, yeah uh, listen to it again or or see it for the first time uh, finally if you have any questions or comments uh, that are not addressed on today's conversation but more generally about iba please feel free to uh, send them to us at info at uh, .org. thank you for uh, uh, the couple of minutes that I needed for, for this. Um, coming to today's session, um, I am extremely happy to uh, welcome with us uh, um, So Young Lim, uh, who was assistant curator of uh, the 14th uh, Guangzhou Biennale, uh, which was titled Soft and Weak Like Water. We will certainly hear from her where the title uh, comes from and where how the project uh, uh, developed. Uh, thank you for being with us, uh, Son Jung. Uh, Son Jung is an independent curator and an art historian based in Seoul in Korea. Uh, recently, uh, a co-curator of uh, My Today, uh, part of the Gwangju Biennial Foundation's uh, May 18 special exhibition. Uh, she was also assistant curator at the Shanghai Project and curated exhibitions uh, at such venues as uh, ASEA, uh, ASEAN uh, Cultural House. Uh, she recently completed her PhD on uh, Lee Sung Tech, uh, the making and unmaking of sculpture in contemporary Korean art at the Courtauld uh, uh, Institute in London. <coughs> Uh, her written work uh, has been published in numerous academic uh, journals and edited volumes, including uh, Sculpture Journal, Journal of History of uh, Modern Art, uh, and Transfer Transformative Jars. Uh, Song Yun Lim uh, currently teaches at uh, Seoul National University, and we are very happy to have you here with us. Uh, after this uh, brief presentation, I'm more than happy to give you the floor and we look forward to, to your presentation. Uh, we will meet afterwards for the Q&A. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Christian, for the very generous introduction. And thank you um, to everyone joining us on Zoom and YouTube and through social media network, um, through live stream um, today. I'm very honored and happy to introduce you um, about the, the theme and the structure and some of the main works at the 14 Gwangju Biennial. So without further ado, let me share my screen. Um, just to give you an overview of this year's edition of the Gwangju Biennale, we um, were a very small curatorial team led by artistic director Suk Young Lee, who is currently a senior curator at Tate Modern. She has been leading the Tate Hyundai Research Center at Tate for many years. Um, we have associate curator Karen Greenberg and my colleague Harry Choi, um, who we've been working very closely to get together over the year to create this biennial with um, 79 artists and collectives from all over the world. As you can see, um, there's a list of artists, participating artists at this edition of the Guangzhou Biennial. Um, this year's theme of the Biennale is called Soft and Weak Like Water. And the title and the theme draws inspiration from a chapter of Dao De Jing, which is a fundamental Taoist text from 400 BC. And to quote from chapter 78, it says, there is nothing softer and weaker than water, and yet there is nothing better for attacking hard and strong things. So rather than looking into literal characteristics of water, we wanted to think about an aqueous model of power that brings forth change, not maybe with an immediate effect, but with enduring and pervasive gentleness flowing across structural divisions and differences. And ultimately, we wanted to imagine our shared planet as a site of resistance, coexistence, and solidarity and care. The theme also relates directly to the question of what art can do today to bring about change and transformation as we face all sorts of crises. Um, and here, I thought it might be worth quoting Suk Young directly from her curatorial statement. And I quote, the artists showcased in the 14th Guangzhou Biennial come from many different corners of the world. While it is not unusual to see such diversity in international art exhibitions, what this biennial hopes to manifest clearly is the significance of individual and seemingly impertinent stories and how they interfere and disrupt dominant accepted narratives when brought together as valuable perspectives and voices. By whom these stories are being spoken is as critical as what is being told, and no one, no one story is more precious than others. As yearnings and murmurs, they can be heard by those who are willing and capable of discerning hushed voices from overpowering noises. Silence is as important as sound, and every dialect is unequivocally treasured. So you can sense that uh, many of the artists and collectors we invited to this uh, Biennale um, were really speaking from their um, lived experiences and many of them who have never really been shown in the typical biennial circuit. And we explore this theme of soft and weak like water through sub, four sub themes or nodes as we call it. And as you can see, um, one of the nodes um, is entitled Luminous Halo. Um, and this node focuses on the diverse forms of resistance and solidarity um, that are consistently found in our daily lives. And as you, some of you might already know, the Guangzhou Biennial was founded in 1994 to commemorate the May 18 Guangzhou democratization movement. Um, in 1980, a group of students and citizens of Guangzhou came together to oppose uh, the military dictatorship led by pre then President Chan Duhan. And this marked an important moment in Korean's, Korea's history of democratization. It also served as an important source of inspiration for democratization movements across different parts of the world. And so this sub theme takes its cue from civic history of Gwangju and explores different forms of resistance and solidarity through art. Ancestral Voices, on the other hand, presents artworks that explore variable connections between traditional healing methods, collective practices rooted in local societies and craft across geopolitical borders. So speaking from their own lived experiences, the artists presented in this section um, of sub-theme proposed that the cultural learnings dismissed as merely local 
or folk traditions could, uh, could in fact serve as cultural assets and potential alternatives for non-Western indigenous communities. Um, thirdly, we had um, a sub-theme or note entitled Transient Sovereignty, uh, which examines the ways in which artistic discourses on colonialism and post-colonialism unfolded through such issues as migration and diaspora. It encompasses various projects, um, as I will show you later in the presentation, that envision the violation of sovereignty, such as the histories of colonization in different parts of the world. And lastly, uh, we have Planetary Times, which explores artistic practices that respond to the ongoing crisis of humanity through the lens of relational cosmology, cosmology that emphasizes change, fluidity, and indeterminacy. Um, and here, many of the works um, featured in this section feature the Earth, or think about the word uh, Earth as a site of shared connections and removed boundaries that is entangled with the Anthropocene. And they propose a planetary vision um, that sort of goes beyond or transcends um, the existing notion of the global. So that's the sort of the main four nodes through which we explore the main um, theme. And as you can see, um, they are explored quite fluidly through um, not only the main venue, which is the Biennial Exhibition Hall, but four other satellite venues um, that are sprawled across the city of Guangzhou. And I will get to this towards the end of the my end of my presentation to kind of introduce how we sort of selected this specific venues and how the works shown in this each venue relate to the context, um, whether architectural or um, cultural or historical. Um, and here to give you more um, detailed information or an, or, or an overview how the biennial hall was used, you can see that um, the entire building, which is more like a warehouse, um, consists of five different galleries. And um, we've sort of laid out the plan so that you would enter into the first gallery, which sort of serves as an introduction to um, these four sub themes. And as you go through each gallery, you'll get to explore the works that are sort of collected or shown together um, in discussion or in dialogue with, that, with each other, exploring the specific sub theme. And here you can see the um, encounter section, which is the first gallery um, that you would walk into um, as you enter the biennial hall. So um, here, this entire space was devoted to a young South African artist called Bukla Bezoesiwani. Um, she is an initiated Sangoma, which means a spiritual healer who works within the space of the dead and the living. Um, and so central to her work is her own body, which operates as subject, object, form, medium, material, language, and the site as she interrogates the patriarchal framing of the Black female experience within the South, uh, South African context. Um, and for the biennial, she stayed over three weeks in Guangzhou to create this uh, specific installation that draws on her personal memories and experiences training as a traditional healer. Um, as soon as you walk in into this room, um, it's very dark and you're invited to walk along this very narrow winding path created with sand and planted grass and tied walls hanging directly uh, from the ceiling. So this naturally leads the viewers into the back of the gallery space, um, which houses three channel projection. Um, entitled Spirits Descend. It's a work from 2022 that's been restaged for the Biennale. And this project, uh, this projection work uh, reimagines or imagines the spirits that reside in the water, in the caves, plains, mountains, and forests. Um, as you can see on the right hand side, um, it's a pro the central projection is um, cast shown right onto a pool of water. So um, we have that very natural elements of sand and water sort of incorporated into this um, sort of very uh, immersive uh, installation. And as you come out of the gallery, you would walk up the ramp and enter the first gallery, which explores the theme of luminous halo. 
And I will just show you a couple of exhibition views from this gallery so you get a sense of how each work was displayed in relation to each other. Here you see a series of paintings, new commission paintings by Eliza Niesenbaum and um, woodcut prints on fabric by a collective from Malaysia called Pangok Sulap. Um, and behind it, which you can see paintings by Kang yong uh, a local uh, Gwangju artist, and um, sculptures by Am jong Sun, which I'll get to um, very soon. Here you see uh, photographs um, by Larry Achampong, juxtaposed with um, sculptures by Am jong Sun and a new work by Margot Zata Migrates uh, the back. Here are some sculptures. Uh, by um, which are actually um, touchable. So the viewers are invited to touch these um, sculptures and um, feel them. And we also have a group of works by uh, Lucia Nogueira. So um, to give you some idea of how some of the main uh, works were commissioned and conceived for the Biennale, um, I will introduce you this new work by Eliza Niesenbaum, who's now based in New York City. Uh, Eliza came to Guangzhou during one of our research trips, and um, she was very interested in working with a local theater group called Ximyeong. Um, it's a group that was founded in 2012, and they're very well known for restaging some of the very important moments from the Gwangju democratization movement in 1980 into, um, into theater. So she accompanied them to, um, to their rehearsals at their studio, um, but also to some of the um, the theater performances that they stage in local um, primary schools. And to the right, you can see Eliza um, with the whole crew, the theater production team, um, and kind of working with the props uh, to kind of see and to get really involved with how this entire theater production comes about. And she went back to New York after the trip um, took many photographs, and not only that, she interviewed all the members of the theater group Shin Myung and used that as a very important resource for this new commission. And here you can see how um, she reinterpreted the scenes from the rehearsals um, into this very distinctive, colorful uh, paintings that um, look into certain restaged, uh, performed scenes of reunification of a mother and a son from the uprising. Uh, another example um, would be Pang Rok Sulap's uh, Gwangju Blooming. This is a series of banners hung from the ceiling. Um, and this is the first work that really welcomes you as you walk into the gallery. Um, Pang Rok Sulap is a collective based in Malaysia. Pang Rok meaning punk rock, um, Sulap meaning like a hut in Malaysian. They are also a music band. And um, they're very well known for going around this um, rural villages in Malaysia, uh, teaching these people, villagers, how to make wood, carves, wood carving prints and allowing them to remember and express their local histories and memories through the media of woodcut print. And so for the Biennale, we invited some of the members to Guangzhou and they stayed um, over a few weeks to visit all this important May 18 related archives and also uh, meeting some of the very key woodcut print artists based in Gwangju. Um, as you might know already, woodcut print was a very important uh, movement that really sort of emerged out of this May 18 democratization uh, movement in Korea. And so this group of members were exchanging with the local artists, learning about um, woodcut print techniques and histories in different countries and the similarities that they shared between Korea and, and Malaysia. And here you can see how the group then re interpreted the history. Um, they selected some of the very key important moments from the history and turned them into um, a, a large scale woodcut print banners. 
And what's great about them is that they encourage collective printing. So uh, during the opening week of the Guangzhou Biennial, we invited the members and the local citizens and also the artists um, that they interacted with to come and do uh, actual collective printing of these works on site. Um, and we have this uh, program actually running through the entire duration of the Biennale so more people can actually use their motherboards to make prints themselves. Uh, Om Jung Sin's Elephant with a Trunk is actually one of the most um, popular works at the Biennial at the moment because um, she also won the Park Silver Art Prize. Um, but what's really striking um, about her work is not only its scale, but you know the its invitation for the public to touch and to sense the work in a very different way. So I'm um, traced um, the history or the long journey of elephant that entered Korea about 600 years ago. And this had allowed, um, sort of encouraged her for over 10 years now to work with visually impaired children um, and inviting them to zoos in Gwangju, around Korea, and also Indonesia, and allowing them to touch this big animal and using it to express their interaction with this animal through clay and um, really giving them the platform to express and communicate uh, in a different way. And this, her interest in vision stem from her question about what it means to to see what vision means for painters like her who used to work as a hyper realist painter and for over 10 years she's been working very closely with this community of visually impaired children and as you can see these are on the top right hand corner this is a clay work that was um, created by one of the students um, who took part in her project and created his or her understanding of the elephant that um, he or she sensed. And based on this model or maquette, um would create in um, sort of a larger scale sculpture that now then invites um, the viewers and the audiences to interact and to, to feel the work. That's why you have four different sculptures um, that are all made out of different um, fabrics and textiles. So you really can, um, touch and sense the differences. Um, th the second gallery um, is called Ancestral Voices. And this is the sort of the first view that you would encounter as you walk into the gallery. And as before, I will sort of quickly browse through the exhibition view so you get a sense of how the works are, are displayed. Um, here we created sort of this long corridor like path um, where we have on the one wall um, a series of ceramic objects by created by artist David Zink E and on the other hand posters by a Japanese Ainu artist Mayun Kiki. And here um, also we have um, installation by Taiwanese artist Char Wei Tsai. And behind this window-like frames, you see installations um, by artists like Mata Aho, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, as you can see, we really try to create an environment where it's not, the space is not blocked uh, or divided by white walls, but rather through frames that allows the works to engage or to be displayed in a dialogue with each other. And for the viewers to kind of create a sense of connection across um, the gallery space. And here is another view of the gallery. So with Ancestral Voices, as I explained to you earlier, it really explores these different forms of knowledge that have been marginalized um, so far. And here you can see um, a new commission by Tarek Atui, who's been working um, for over three years with um, local artisans based in Gwangju area. And he created a series of new musical equipment that are entirely inspired by um, the materials that these local artisans work with, which are ceramic, water, um, wood, and also paper. 
And here, changgu or puk, which are traditional Korean uh, percussion equipment, are repurposed to create a different sound. And here, they're um, connected to each other. So maybe a drop of water or a swivel of um, this uh, movement on the other corner of the installation kind of um, activates uh, different noise or different sound. And together, they create a very unique soundscape. Um, and here we have uh, a large scale site specific, site -specific installation by Mata Aho, um, which sort of anchors um, the works that are um, shown around it. And here, this is the collective based in uh, from New Zealand. And um, they're a group of four Maori women who individually also work as um, lens-based um, artists. And here you can see that they're using a very typical um, tie downs, um, which are repurposed um, into an installation that recreates or celebrates the traditional Maori weaving technique. And um, using the three pillars that supports the gallery structure, um, the Mata Aho Collective um, sort of beautifully weaved together these two different, differently colored uh, tie downs that are usually um, used in everyday life to uh, bring or to secure um, objects to travel long distances um, into, uh, into this beautiful installation. We also have work by Edgar Kallel, um, two new installation, uh, two new works indeed. One is um, the, the echo of an ancient form of knowledge, which is composed of rocks and various types of vegetables and fruits, uh, which performs as um, like a ritual um, or an offering to the artist ancestors. He belongs to the Guatemalan Kakchikil um, community and um, during the opening ceremony, he used this layout or this display of fruits as an offering to, to his ancestors, paying a tribute to, to, to their lives. And um, at the center now, um, you can see a little um, equipment or tool that he used to uh, use during this ritual performance. And at the back, you see a new drawing, a large scale drawing by the artist, which also depicts a very humble, um, hut uh, in which his grandmother used to live. And so he, at the bottom, you can see uh, his grandmother sort of sleeping in the, in the bed. One of the important um, aspects of this gallery was um, really trying to rethink ways to present performance work, um, especially the performance art staged by um, one of the first sort of generations of Korean artists um, and allowing audiences to sort of take part in um, restaging their, their work. And so artists like Lee Gon Yong, Kim Go Rim, and Sun Tek Lee um, were working in the 1960s and 1970s sort of questioning and challenging the tradition of sculpture and introducing um, very experimental and performative works um, at the time. And here uh, to the left, you can see Bodyscape um, by Lee Gon Yong, which was initially staged in 1976. And it involves a simple gesture of tracing or marking the movement of an arm, sort of swinging back and forth along the wall. And this kind of shows the limitation of how your body can move. And um, rather than inviting the artist to reenact this performance, we've invited the um, viewers, anyone interested in, in taking part in this activity to grab a crayon and to basically perform what the artist had done back in 76. And as the um, biennial, uh, goes on, we have more lines, more traces from different visitors, leaving um, them on this one large sheet of paper. So it collects and accumulates this collective traces. And um, to the right, you can also see another example where um, this time we reinterpreted Kim Gurim's body painting. 
and um, we have the sort of stations where the visitors are invited to have a little tattoos or paintings, body paintings drawn on their uh, on their arms as sort of a, a collection souvenir or a, a memoir of their visit to the Biennale. And they have been hugely popular and we had really great positive responses from the visitors so far. Uh, now moving on to our third theme and gallery, um, it's transient sovereignty. So in this section, we look at different forms of um, decolonial practices and many of the artists um, involved in this section um, work very closely with Korean or Gwangju based communities as well, looking into different forms um, or types of colonial histories that still govern um, the Korean society at large. Um, here you see uh, works by Changjia, uh, large uh, sort of circular installation that was staged at the center of these, this gallery space. And um, also a five channel projection work by Mayor Koizumi, a series of sculptures by Guadalupe Maravilla and um, a wall drawing that he had created from a North Korean defect. So to give you a more uh, sort of in-depth information or overview of um, some of the works that were presented in this section, um, I have Mayor Koizumi's um, The Theater of Life. Um, to the left, you can see the artist um, who's, who's based in Japan at the moment doing conducting a research trip in Gwangju at a village called Koryo in village. Um, so here we have a group or a community of Koryo in which refers to diaspora Koreans um, who were based in Central Asia. So in the early 1930s, we have a group of Koreans moving into um, Russia and uh, to, into Central Asia in search for food and for um, in order to sustain living. And this quickly then evolved into um, the formation of Korean communities, diasporic communities. And we have a, a long history of Korean theater or Koryo theater that were born out of this um, community, sort of these communities that were displaced uh, throughout different parts of um, Central Asia. And in the early 2000s, this uh, Korean or Koryoin community would slowly come back to Korea um, to, to search new jobs, new um, better paying positions. And um, eventually this meant that um, the community of uh, Korea in grew very quickly over the years and, and as the Korean government relaxed the policy and granted visas for these people to to work and to live in Korea, they grew uh, the size of these communities in Korea grew very quickly. And yet um, rarely do these people get recognized as sort of citizens of Gwangju or like people of Gwangju. And it was very important for Mayo to visit how the community was thriving within um, the city and how this children, young, younger generations of um, Koryoin were trying to, or struggling to settle in as, um, as sort of this diaspora community now based in Korea. And so for this project, Theater of Life, he collaborated with 15 teenagers from the Koryoin community and conducted a two-day theater workshop um, during which they were able to revisit some of the archival documents that were created from Koryo Theater. So Koryo Theater was uh, one of the first theaters run by Koreans um, outside of Korea. And um, it still remains uh, intact and is still active today, uh, based in Kazakhstan. And um, it sort of, throughout this decades and years, um, the theater production company were able to stage some of the very uh, iconic, meaningful productions from Korea and um, from the classical um, pieces. And Mera was struck by this, uh, the archival documents that were created by this theater production. And he has done incredible amount of research 
and invited the students to revisit the photographs um, from the 1940s and 50s production and um, allow them to sort of recreate or re-perform these scenes. And that's why you can see in, in the middle of this projection, um, people, some of the students in uh, wearing um, different costumes and also allowing them to express their concerns and their struggles in a different way through this theater workshop. And by merging the photographs and video footage that he took from this workshop into this uh, large scale five channel projection, you have a, a silent sort of moving image that constantly um, juxtaposes or overlaps with sort of this black and white, more historical images with a bluish, uh, very bright, um, footage from actual footage from the theater workshop and you are invited to sort of sit and immerse yourself into this sort of foliage um, of images. Another example um, I would like to introduce to you is a series of photographs by Oh Sok He um, is based in Incheon which is located um, outside of Seoul and what he's been researching for over 10, 10 years is um, what we call enemy houses. So these houses were created, built during the Japanese colonial period and sort of left to the Koreans. And um, you can see that some of the surviving buildings or the so-called enemy houses were repurposed, repurposed to fit the needs of the Koreans. And he would invite, um, he would go into this uh, residential buildings and try to photograph and document what's, um, what remains there and also what's been repurposed. And you can really sort of see through the lens of this very private spaces, um, the history of um, colonialism in Korea and how um, these remnants have been um, sort of reused through, throughout the years for different purposes. Um, lastly, uh, we have Planetary Times, which is the fifth gallery that you would enter into before exiting the Biennial Hall. Um, here are some of the exhibition views. Um, we have Kim Lim's uh, sculptures um, and set against uh, Yuma Taro's um, hanging soft like tongue sculptures in the back and also work by um, Alan Michelson. And as you can see here, um, a, a huge, a, a, an installation by Robert Jai Ren Hui, um, who is a Singaporean artist um, entitled Trying to Re Remember a River, Trying to Remember a River. It basically follows or documents many of the unnamed um, tributaries that flows through Singapore and that have over the years turned into lands or filled with concretes to create more space for buildings. And here um, the installation is composed of objects or materials that the artist collected through um, during his visits to this site um, and also video recordings and sound recordings um, that he collected through this visits. Um, and as if um, encountering an archaeological site, you enter into a room and you see this now gone um, rivers, unnamed rivers um, through the video works and also um, the remaining sort of ruins that are displayed on the on the table. We also have a new commission by a Lithuanian artist, Emilia Skarnilute. Um, this immersive video projection um, sort of documents the artist wearing a mermaid suit and literally swimming across the Amazonian river. And um, she sort of by embodying this um, fictional, also non-human um, being, um, she converges um, or interacts physically with the nature and through her movement um, through this Amazonian river, you really get to see the condition and the ecological state of the, the environment along the river. Uh, we also have more sort of a traditional um, presentations or reflections on nature, for instance, like a series of painting uh, works by Bin Jung Kim. Um, they 
pay tribute to the tradition of Santre painting, but um, rather than being sort of ink paintings, they're actually composed of torn Korean paper, um, the sides of which have been burnt. So it's a very um, sort of labor intensive, ritualistic um, form of making. And here you can see what reminds us of um, mountains and um, seas and oceans that sort of um, surround us. Um, one thing I'd like to highlight is that we really tried um, to incorporate um, sort of this connecting spaces like the ramps and the bridges that are part of the biennial hall building. Um, and as you can see with uh, Charlie Kumar Singh Barman's Carnival Arnaki, which is a large sort of mural with um, a neon sign um, towards the end of the biennial hall. And also um, a sound ins installation by Pan Dai Jing. It's called Scale Figures. It, there are eight channel speakers that are hung across the bridge that connects gallery three and four. And as you walk across the bridge, you get to sort of hear this, um, the sound work that are composed of different voices inspired by Chinese opera, and which also uh, connects you to another offsite venue um, near the biennial. So it's a two part installation. And we also have an example by Sunye Li. Um, she used the entire wall along the ramp that connects two different galleries and the, the wall to kind of um, create this very intimate but also overwhelming um, sort of effect whereby um, her understanding or interest in this local purification ritual called Kut um, is reinterpreted to kind of um, uh, send uh, send off spirits um, or dead spirits and um, sort of using this space as a way to connect um, different galleries, exploring different sub-themes. Um, so now I'd like to quickly go into the satellite venues, um, one of which was Kwangju National Museum. It's about 15 minute walk away from the Biennial Hall. And this time we worked very closely with the curatorial team at the museum. And um, one of the interesting outcomes of this collaboration is that not only the artist who was um, featuring the work, responded to the museum's incredible Asian art ceramic collection, but the curatorial team at the museum responded um, back to the work by the participating artists. So an example um, of this would be by Candice Lin. Um, she created this um, multifaceted installation composed of sound work, animation, ceramics, and um, also an architectural building where she looked into the history of lithium battery production combined with the history of ceramic making, which also involves um, lithium uh, when you glaze the ceramic pieces. And so she was uh, very interested in the history of ceramic production in Asia and loved the collection at the museum. And when she came up with this idea, which also looked at the labor conditions, um, she uh, threw this idea of factory um, and making batteries in factory and the kind of hallucinations that the workers experience by working with this very toxic chemi toxic chemicals like lithium. Um, the curator from the museum also responded and created this uh, new sort of temporary ex uh, exhibition, as you can see at the back, where they display works from the 14th century. Um, these are ceramic artifacts from that period, um, and they talk about this sort of um, uh, series of uh, manufacturing or production uh, that also speaks to the very harsh labor conditions and also incorporates documents um, that speak about uh, labor treatment and working conditions during that time. So this was a very interesting collaboration um, that we did. And 
as you can see here with another satellite uh, venue at Horangasi Art Polygon. It's a, a local art community based in Yangnim Mountain. Uh, we try not to just rent the venue um, just to display the work, but really um, sort of cite individual work so that they can be in conversation with the given context. Um, so here we have Japanese artist Yuko Mori's um, IO, which means input and output. And it consists of different elements that are activated by the, the changing environmental condition of the space. So depending on how cold it is or how damp it is, the looping paper will loop at different, uh, different speed. And uh, this little um, sort of machine will sort of capture the dust that's being collected by the paper and create sound and also activate different parts of the installation. So it's a very organic system that responds closely to the changing conditions of the space. Another satellite uh, venue we have uh, um, is Mugaksa. It's a Buddhist temple located at the heart of Gwangju. And here we have works by five different artists which explore the cyclical um, sort of the, the cycle of life and death and, and works that are particularly sort of reflective um, and also uh, quite philosophical. And here you see an example by Liu Jinhua, um, Shanghai-based artist, who's created a series of um, discs, ceramic discs or porcelain discs that acts as a mirror, um, but also as sort of a light source that allows you to reflect on yourself, on your life, and also to kind of see, see yourself um, clearly. And this also um, draws inspiration from the Buddhist teaching of allowing yourself or cleaning yourself, your soul to reflect the society and to see yourself clearly. Uh, lastly, we have Art Space House. This is a very small um, Hanok style traditional Korean um, architecture that um, used to be um, that are still being that's still being run by um, a curator as a art community space. Um, the directors, the current directors, parents used to live in the space, and that's why we housed um, this new film by Naimo Hyman. Uh, in this very personal, intimate space. It's um, a work that talks about an Indian couple, married Indian couple, living in uh, an abandoned hospital. And it talks about sort of the role of the caregiver and the caretaker. And so the visitors are invited to sit down um, and um, sit on the sofa and watch the film, which lasts for about an hour in this very intimate surrounding. So this is all I have prepared for today. I hope um, you have questions or if you are um, interested in anything else for me to expand on, please feel free to do so. Thank you, so, uh, Soyun. Uh, it was a, a wonderful walk through uh, the whole exhibition. And uh, it was... Uh, inspiring and uh, personally I was uh, very happy to see <clears throat> a lot of uh, uh, names of artists that I've come across before but also many that uh, I haven't uh, and some of their work and um, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and, and ask you some of the questions that I wrote down uh, while listening to you uh, while we wait uh, for whoever from the audience to to reach out, of course. Um, and I think I'll, I'll start with a more uh, with a more general question about the process behind uh, the making of the Bainia. And uh, I have two questions that relate more to this, and the rest is more about specific elements of, of what you described. And uh, you mentioned the the small curatorial team behind the band um that developed the project um can you give us a sense of how you work together and what kind of process uh was there in terms of um you know uh developing the concept selecting the artists uh and so on 
and uh, yeah, um, I'll follow up with other questions. But uh... <laughs> thank you for that question. Um, and the short answer would be Zoom, many Zoom calls, uh, late night Zoom calls, early morning Zoom calls. But because um, we were all separated across the world, I was based in Seoul. Um, another creator was based in San Francisco, others based in London. So we really have to work out and um, try and meet regularly um, so that we can work effectively and also, um, you know, because there's so much to cover. Um, while working on the Biennale, we really tried hard to make most out of um, our regular meetings, Zoom meetings. Um, but just to give you an idea of how it sort of progressed um, during this preparation period, we had um, initial proposal by Suk Kyung, who had already sort of formulated the overall theme and so, sort of the sub themes or the nodes, as I explained, um, and the list of initial list of artists um, that we can work with. And we each curator had um, a set of artists, um, mainly sort of based on regions because of the time timing and also the, for practical reasons, um, language communications as well. So for instance, I was mainly in charge of artists from Asia and, and Korea and others from Latin America and um, North America and also Europe and Africa. So we each have had a group of artists that we work with and um, the artistic director Su Kyung sort of oversaw the overall um, liaising and communication with the artists and other uh, partnering organizations. And we, of course, had the Biennial Foundation um, that were supporting the, the process, especially, you know, with the admin um, processes, also um, accruing important funding resource from the local government um, and uh, working very closely with uh, the partners um, that were then sort of at the later phase of the preparation who joined us to sort of realize the planning that we had had been doing. Thank you. And while waiting for questions from the audience, I have a, a follow up on the process and then I'll, I'll switch more to the conceptual elements and uh, and so on. Um, you mentioned the, um, the collaboration with other venues like the Guangzhou National Museum, uh, Horn Sai Art Polygon. I'm sure I slaughtered that. I'm very sorry for that, um, which sound like like a great su success, not just in terms of using these venues, but also establishing a dialogue with the with the people that run it uh, and the curatorial team there, and, and so on. Uh, now, for those that maybe are less acquaintance with the uh, with the Guangzhou Biennial and so on, is this uh, is this something unusual? Uh, this form of collaboration, not the use of other venues, but this form of like really integrating uh, the the curatorial um, work, let's say, behind. Uh, um, Behind the final exhibition making, let's say, uh, or is it something that uh, you know it's a it's a process that that has happened before and so on. And and what were the challenges as well? Because I imagine that of course, as you def as you defined it, it's not just renting a space, uh, which would make it easy because you just get given a, a white cube somewhere else, uh, but you're also entering uh, specific uh, processes within within another ex uh, within another institution, let's say. And, and dynamics. Um, I mean, you know, with the Guangzhou Biennial, um, it's definitely not new to use um, venues uh, across Guangzhou that, um, in sort of as satellite venues to the main Biennial Hall. But as you mentioned, um, it's quite unusual that we went sort of this far with collaboration with each in the individual venue and the organizers of the venue. Um, so I must really sort of pay um, credit to the, ven the the museum team, the curatorial team, um, and each venue's sort of organizing team because they had, um, some of them had previous experiences of working with the biennial, and they were actually very, very 
uh, proactive in sort of initiating this kind of collaboration. So they were also saying that, you know, we don't want to be just venues that rent out space. We really want to do something more collaborative um, on a curatorial level. And that's why they were very eager to listen to us and to respond to our uh, proposals. And um, I think that's how we were able to work this out together uh, in a very short period of time. They were also very generous um, and understanding of our um, sort of list of artists that we proposed to them and trying to really sort of make this work. Uh, there is a question from the audience and uh, I don't know if uh, Nadine uh, Khalil wants to pose it herself, otherwise I'm more than happy to just read it out for everyone. Um, I'm just waiting a second. I think I'll just read it out. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so her question is, uh, uh, you mentioned in the beginning that water was less about water as a material and more as a quality. Uh, can you say more about the decision to place the first work you mentioned uh, uh, as an opening work? Sure. Um, so I think this is something that many people come back to us saying, oh, you mentioned that the the bit, the theme isn't really about the water. And yet there's so many works that sort of either incorporate the um, water as, as an um, actual medium or an element of work or representation um, or imagery. And um, with the work by Buklavezwe Siwani, we didn't really sort of use or int introduce the work um, or incorporated the work as an introductory piece because it had sort of a pool of water. Uh, more, um, we liked the idea that her practice um, sort of combines different elements or different subtopics that we're exploring. For instance, this idea of sort of paradigmic, paradynamics and uh, colonialization, um, but also the notion of the planetary and the ecological issues that we were uh, addressing, um, but also the daily encounters um, of um, solidarity and resistance. So all of these uh, issues and subtopics that we're exploring were um, being um, explored in her installation. And so we thought it's important that we kind of use this as a platform for people to, to walk in to, and to really immerse themselves rather than sort of thinking about messages and statements and themes immediately. And kind of through that experience, through that introductory uh, um, sort of procession um, that they can then go into the gallery and to really sort of explore the theme um, in a more concrete way, so to speak. I hope that sort of answered your question. Uh, there is another question. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Uh, by Hui Yong Yu. I hope I read your name correctly. Sorry. Uh, thank you for your insight, in, insightful uh, presentation. Prior to posing my question, I want to emphasize that it is intended to shed lights on the subject matter rather than criticize it. Upon examining uh, the exhibition's themes, I noticed uh, that they revolve around significant challenges uh, arising from the global from global capitalism. These challenges encom encompass the dichotomy between tradition and, moder and modernity, the, the impacts of post slash colonialism, and uh, migration and diaspora. Uh, the pursuit of ecological environmental justice and exploration of alternative modes of coexistence and connectivity. Uh, these thought-provoking uh, topics are uh, actively explored uh, within contemporary art discourses and exhibitions. Uh, hence, uh, I'd like to hear about the unique aspect of your curatorial strategies and approaches that set them apart from previous or current exhibitions. Well, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you so much for that um, insightful question. Um, you're absolutely right that these topics are not new. Um, and actually the theme of soft and weak like water, if you think about other biennials like the Sydney Biennial or um, the recent Shanghai Biennial, they all similarly sort of look into this um, motive of water or fluidity through different avenues. And so in a way we are sharing this um, interest 
or a kind of urgency that the artistic community around the world um, is also expressing in different ways through different themes. And I guess the main um, sort of thing that sets this biennial apart is the works themselves. Um, we have these common themes that are being um, explored by you know, uh, different people, um, the communities of the artistic community, um, yet we have invited artists um, and sort of put them in a dialogue within a set space to explore the themes um, together collectively and also through the ways that this individual artist um, have been expressing and um, communicating for many years. And that's why we uh, put a lot of emphasis on this notion of lived experiences. So rather than um, featuring artists who often uh, work uh, with certain messages or using the work artwork as a medium to um, to propose uh, a statement, uh, we really try to incorporate different voices and forms of practices that reflect on um, concrete and lived experiences that the artist has been um, pursuing. Uh, I hope that yeah also explains uh, a bit about your question. I'm also happy to expand on it. Maybe that was enough. I think, Christian, you are turned, you're muted. Apologies. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think they they uh, sent me a message that they were happy for uh, happy yeah. about the, the answer. Uh, I have I have to say many more questions. Uh, I'll try maybe to pose another couple because we're a bit over time already. But I think it's it's fine to take a few extra minutes, uh, given the the very interesting exhibitions that you that you presented. And um, uh, there's two, there's two maybe that I can focus on. Uh, one of which is uh, um, you described the four sections, the four nodes uh, that the biennial is built on, um, and uh, and you gave examples of how these are displayed in space and so on in the, especially in the main uh, in the main uh, biennial venue. Uh, I was wondering. To, to what extent and in what ways uh, these also intertwine um, within the exhibition, uh, or rather if these are really taken as four different chapters that, that live uh, sequentially, let's say, uh, from each other. I mean, you did mention these connecting spaces uh, when you were describing some of the works, but I'm not sure whether these were just your attempt of using these spaces or if they were actually used as as way of interconnecting the the conceptual elements of the of the show yeah so um basically we didn't want to um organize the space so thematically so that it's sort of like uh, you have one on luminous halo and then you tick the box and you go to move on to the next one actually a lot of the works that we feature within the biennial can be placed in different nodes so to speak and that's why we wanted to use the satellite venues to kind of make more fluid connections between the four nodes so um, instead of prescribing um one venue per subtopic like we did with the biennial hall galleries we put different works exploring different themes in one venue for instance like the Guangzhou um, National Museum we had a work sort of that was more relevant to transient sovereignty next to a work from um, from the node of planetary times kind of sort of in relation to each other so you are given the opportunity to um, sense that these topics are, in the end, interrelated and interconnected. Thank you for that. And I think I'll, well, I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, uh, I believe that one of the most relevant and interesting aspects of, uh, of working on, in the scale of a manual and with the uh, potentials that, that arise from it uh is the chat is the the especially with commissioned work is the chance of giving or is the possibility of giving artists a 
who are not from uh, a specific uh, cultural region, uh, city, and so on, a chance of exploring it. And you gave some examples, uh, Alisa Niesenbaum's uh, exploration, uh, Meiru Kuzumi's uh, work, and so on. Um, I just wanted to ask you, uh, and you described their process quite in, deep, quite in depth, so I think it's, it's quite evident how they work. Uh, how they worked uh, while on sites. Uh, I'm more interested in understanding uh, how you guided them in, uh, how you as the curatorial team, let's say, guided them in, in developing these, uh, these researchers. Uh, and uh, I mean, not just practically in terms of, you know, giving them access to, to specific uh, people or to specific spaces, uh, but more in terms of conceptual uh, thinking about uh, what kind of work they would do on site and how they yeah. would encounter let's say, the locality of, of Wanju and of Korea in general? It's always um, a, a big concern, um, or I mean, it's also fun to um, work with the artist um, on new commissions for, you know, biennial like this, because you're really given the opportunity to research together and to really sort of think about making this new work together. And that also, you know, we're very reliant on the help from the Guangzhou Biennial Foundation in that regard, because um, the exhibition team from the foundation really um, helps a lot with uh, doing the initial phase of researching, um, helping with um, or like arranging meetings with the local, local communities that the artists might be interested in and really sort of carrying the that sort of communication and collaboration throughout the production period. So um, we have the artist and the curatorial team sort of being in close conversation, sharing where the theme comes from, you know, what are some of the issues and topics that we're looking at and how this might relate to the artist's existing practice and ongoing interest. And we then have the Guangzhou Biennial Foundation really then supporting us very practical help with arranging meetings with the communities. But I mean, I it was quite beneficial for me that I had experience with Guangzhou Biennial with the previous edition. And I had already done a bit of research um, with communities in Guangzhou. So for instance, like Mayor Koizumi's um, collaboration with the Koryoin um, community, I was always interested how we talk about the people of Guangzhou. And yet we all, there are uh, a group or a community of people who are sort of marginalized from this discourse or our conception or understanding of the citizen. So um, I thought it would be a great opportunity for artists like Mayra Koizumi to then work with Koryoin uh, community to really look in depth about their history and why they are here and how they belong to the Guangzhou um, cities, uh, city at large. Um, so it's, it's a fun process, but also involves a lot of work and dialogue and communication, as you, as you know. Of course, of course. And, and as you said, it's it's also one of the more uh, fun part, I think, of uh, of working at, uh, in in such a project. I'll uh, conclude with one last question. Uh, I had two, but I think I'll I'll skip one of them. Uh, which is, I was uh, I was really fascinated by the inclusion of the um, of these older generation of Korean artists uh, uh, that I had come across in in, in previous exhibitions and so on, uh, and especially <clears throat> the way in which you you brought their their performance uh, works to to today's basically. You no, know? you you brought them not just back in terms of restating it, but really kind of reconceptualizing it with the with the, uh, with allowing people to to basically participate in in this and restaging it, um, I was wondering, uh, and this is a question that comes from from someone that is not that acquainted with the with the Korean scene and with how much uh, these artists are kind of present in in people's imaginary. Uh, I'm trying to understand how much these works would have still been in the audience imagery and and imagine in, in like in in their uh, in their perception, let's say, uh, or whether it was a first encounter with uh, with these works for for the most for the vast majority of the of the audience. Um, that's a great, laid out, let's say. Yeah, that's a great question because that was also a. a important um, factor when we're considering how to present this works. 
um, you know, will the um, viewers be familiar with the work? As an art history, I as an art historian, I am very familiar, but for um, the larger, broader audience, it might not be the case. So uh, we offered um, QR codes with the, the interpretations so that um, if they're interested, they can access the interviews, the video interviews that we con conducted with the individual artists. So they get um, sort of the context that they need to understand where the original work um, comes from and how you know it's being sort of restaged in this sort of new biennial context. So these were sort of layers of con, um, information that we tried to provide to the visitors if they're interested in exploring more uh, in depth. Mm -hmm. are, are these interviews something that you did specifically for for these artists, or is it something that you did for the whole uh, header of the for the whole artist list, basically? So these three artists um, specifically, because as you mentioned, they needed context, um, but we also um, created different videos for different artists. For instance, um, with Book Vezwe and um, uh, Guadalupe Maravilla, who are more like sort of process driven works, um, we created behind the scenes sort of more documentary videos. So you can kind of see how the work was produced on site. Um, some other works we did uh, videos were more sort of interviews with the artists in their studio. So you also get a context of how the work has been sort of produced in the larger artistic practice of the artist. So we have different set of um, videos that we've, we've created um, that are all uploaded on our Guangzhou, 14 Guangzhou Biennial website, uh, which you're free to um, explore. Wonderful. Um, we'll make sure and we remind everyone that is watching this to go right. and explore more of the website. Um, with this, I think I want to thank you very much for the presentation today. It was great to, uh, first of all, to have the Guangzhou Biennial again uh, here on IBA uh, or with us. Um, it's uh, it's always a pleasure to to hear what's going on in uh, in Guangzhou, and it's been a fascinating Biennial throughout the years. Uh, and I think this edition, for whoever has the chance, seems like a particularly um, and thrilling one. Um, before leaving everyone, I want to remind that the Biennial is uh, still on view until the 9th of July. Yeah. Uh, so whoever is in Korea, I very much advise to pass by and see it. And uh, yeah, I want to really thank you for, for your time, for, for your effort today. It was, uh, it was great to, to hear a bit more about uh, uh, the works and, uh, and the process behind them. Yeah. Well, thank you for having us and for allowing us to share, um, you know, the biennial. Thank you for the time. And thank you, for, uh, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, everyone, for joining. As you, as you mentioned, uh, I also want to thank uh, my colleague Jennifer, who is working behind the scenes uh, for everything technical to work out fine. Um, I just want to remind everyone to keep following our website and social media for future events. And uh, a reminder that uh, the conversation today uh, is being recorded and will be uh, uploaded to our YouTube channel as well as our website as soon as it's edited in the next few days. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.